So I'm Justin St. George, and today I am interviewing Mr. Fred Crippen. Now, they call you Dr. Fred Crippen. Why is that? Well, not everybody calls me Dr. Fred Crippen. Only uh, Mike Petrucci does. And uh, I, don't even, I don't even sure whether he's aware of the cultural significance of such a statement. But uh, the real Dr. Crippen is in the Wax Museum in London. Uh, he was the last person publicly hanged in London. He was one of Alfred Hitchcock's favorite people. Um, the poor guy, direct relation, uh, apparently he had some problems with his wife or whatever. She was running around with another guy or something like that. So he was accused of killing her. And in a very Edgar Allan Poe fashion, he, according to the authorities, chopped her up and put her body parts underneath the floorboards in their apartment. And um, he uh, attempted, to, uh, according to the authorities, again, attempted to use the wrong kind of lie to dispose of the body. It was the kind of lie that uh, preserves the body. So when they came in, the neighbors got a little bit suspicious. They dug it up. They found all of these body parts. He, on the other hand, was having an affair with his secretary and tried to make a run for it across the Atlantic with his girlfriend, who he had dressed as a boy and who boarded the ferry to Amsterdam, I believe, with a hat box which supposedly contained Mrs. Crippen's head. It was all pretty gruesome stuff. So anyway, to make a long story short, he's the first guy captured via the transcontinental cable, what we now know as the telegraph. They, they tried to escape to Canada. He was apprehended, came back, uh, had a very bad attorney. And uh, he was convicted and hanged, and his girlfriend got off. Lived, to be lived until 1953, Evelyn Deneuve. And uh, now DNA evidence is coming to light. And it's actually, the DNA is pointing to the fact that that woman under the floorboard was not Mrs. Crippen after all. So Dr. Crippen is not exactly the way, the medical profession has never really held any particular um, allure for anybody in my family. Well, it sounds like a typical fairy tale story. I mean, guy, I mean, guy falls in love, guy chops off a woman. I mean. uh, there was absolutely no fairy tale about Dr. Crippen. He married a girl from Brooklyn. She was a vaudeville star, this woman who ended up married. They used to call her the Big Matza because she, when they were married, she was 130 pounds. And by the time they moved to England, she was closer to 250 pounds. So she ballooned up nicely and took a lover, and he uh, was a doctor, dentist, whatever you want to call it, and there was some question about his speculation. There was absolutely nothing in his story that uh, even smacks of a fairy tale. Very hideous reality uh, for the uh, Crippen family. But he had a bad lawyer. It's a legacy. I mean, something to talk about. But anyway, getting back to you. Yeah. How, how oh, by the way, that was 1911 when that happened, right before the First World War, wow. or when they hanged them. Yeah. So we, we're fast-forwarding almost a century to May. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell, tell me about your childhood. Where did you grow up? Um, okay, what I, your childhood was like? Uh, you know, I was like the war baby, early 50s. Uh, my dad, a vet, my mom, they were both from Brooklyn. And they met, and they got married, and um, they moved to, I was born in uh, Flushing, Queens, and we moved uh, into an apartment, or they moved into an apartment the first couple of years of my life. We were in Jamaica, Queens, not far from St. John's University, and then, uh, like the 1950s dream machine, uh, he moved out to Long Island, and we lived on the South Shore in a little town called Baldwin which is most famous for the, uh, the hometown of Joey Buttafuoco's body shop, who got involved with the Amy Fisher affair, the Long Island Lolita. And uh, it was like um, happy days, you know? It was the 50s. Yeah, that's what it was. And um, that's pretty much my, my childhood. You know, I have a younger brother and sister, and uh, they still live in New York. I'm the only one that ever moved out of there. So... so what was your high school life oh, like? Oh, my high school life. C compared to what you see now at Seekonk High School well, as a teacher, how was it like you my as a life, student? My life is completely different than most. Most people, they start out in Catholic school 
and they have a problem with the nuns or they have a problem with the priests, they get kicked out and they end up in public school. I started out in public school on Long Island and in New York, and I got kicked out of public school in the uh, fifth grade. How'd you get kicked out? Well, it was an unfortunate misunderstanding between myself and a couple of other male gentlemen in the fifth grade, and it had to do with what someone said about my sister. And uh, uh, the, I apparently had lost my temper and went a little bit, you know, whatever. And uh, they brought me into the educational psychiatrist and whatever, and they all sat me down and they, they said, why did you want to do that? Because he said that about my sister, whatever. They, to make a long story short, my mother, who was mortified, said, we, there's only one thing to do with this boy, and that's to send him to the nuns. So I got kicked out in the fifth grade, so I ended up going to Catholic school for sixth, seventh, and eighth, and then went to a Catholic high school uh, in Mineola, Long Island, called Chaminade. And, you know, I spent four years there. What, what, it would probably be like, uh, oh, it was all boys, so what, I don't even know what you got, just all boys. Maybe like a, a Bishop Hendrickson, right, okay? Right, right. But there were like 2,000 kids in it. Um, very competitive academically, very competitive athletically, and uh, yeah, I got into that whole athletic, uh, uh, student athlete type of thing. Different from here? Yeah, yeah, sure. We had no freedom. We had none. Okay, it was a Catholic school. I mean, we had virtually no freedom. Uh, we were uh, repressed. Uh, there was absolutely no questioning of what was going on. Uh, you could be in trouble. You could get in trouble if you attended a Vietnam War protest. Uh, heck, we didn't have girls. You know, when we had high school dances, they had to bring girls in from what were then known as sister schools. <coughs> Pardon me. Poor girls. Oof. We used to wait for them. Buses would pull up and down they would come. And we would just be done with a football game in the fall or something like that, and we'd just showered and we'd be watching them get off these buses, and it was like a cattle call, and the poor girls, they'd have to walk by us, and, you know, the ones that were pretty would get the obvious calls, and the ones that were, would, that had good personalities would get quite the other call. And it was just a savage, savage rite of early adolescence to post that, or the late adolescence, the whole thing with women. You know, of course, being refereed by priests, which is an unusual thing to begin with. So yeah, we were repressed, uh, but we were and we were fortunate because the staff we had were very enlightened instructors. So I felt like I got a first class education and first class coaching as well. So after your <clears throat> adventures in Catholic school, yeah. what happened? Did you go to college? Did yeah, you... sure. Actually, what happened was because I went to a Catholic school. Uh, there's like this built-in network, and I absolutely despised the climate in, on Long Island and in New York and in the Northeast. I hated uh, ice scrapers. I hated getting up in the, you know, and it being 17 degrees. I hated the fact that the snow didn't stop until late April. So uh, I was recruited to play baseball at a place called Loyola University in New Orleans, and uh, they sat down with my parents and the guidance counselor. My grades were decent put together this whole thing, how would you like to go? And I said, yeah, sure. I didn't even visit. As wow. soon as I heard that it was in New Orleans, I said, my gosh, that's pretty Southern. And uh, I'd read all about New Orleans and you know, fiction and things like that. And I said, wow, what a romantic place to go to. Great, sign me up. So I went down there, sight unseen. So when you moved to New Orleans, yeah. Was it much, much different from the Northeast? Did you have it's, to like relearn culture? It and... continues to be much different than the Northeast. New Orleans is different than Louisiana. I, I would contend that of all the places I visited in this country, New Orleans is the most unique and the closest to being in Europe. Uh, they don't have the same set of laws. They have Napoleonic codes. It's much more of a wide open city. It's much more of a, I don't know, be, probably because the whole city involves the service industries of restaurants and bars and entertainment and music. It's, a, it's, it's just a completely, as repressed as I was in the Northeast or felt that way, that's as wide open as the South was to me. And, you know, being an English major and all of that was a big thing, too, because it was also a writer's mecca as well. So it was absolutely a phenomenal place. And in fact, tomorrow, I was just telling you guys earlier, 
Before we got started, tomorrow opens up carnival season. Uh, this coming Tuesday will be Mardi Gras Day. And spent uh, a lot of Mardi Gras down there. And uh, believe it or not, I know it's hard for you to believe, but now it's February 16th. In New Orleans, we probably, and this comes back from playing and coaching down there, we probably would have already played five or six baseball games wow. by now. It's still winter here in New Orleans. I know. Orleans, oh, no, so. I know. Yeah. And by there, by the time St. Patrick's Day rolls around, it's 80 degrees. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I had a good time, and I got a great education, and uh, yeah. You went from the wide open spaces and adventures of New Orleans yeah. to a little town in Massachusetts. Can you tell me about that? Well, there were a couple of speed stops along the way. Okay, but well, 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 what talk happened about was that, that uh, at Loyola, they had decided to take. Uh, their NCAA sports program and basically lose it. Uh, they weren't making any money. Uh, they had decided they were going to go to club sports, so it was everybody abandoning ship. You could stay on and be an RA or do an intramural program or whatever, but a lot of my teammates went across the street to Tulane. I decided to go uh, on yet another adventure. I went out west and to Arizona State University, stayed in Tempe, graduated from there. Uh, and then decided to, uh, you know, get into teaching. And so I taught in uh, a little bitty bitty town outside of St. Louis, right on the Mississippi River in the Illinois side, Alton, Illinois, in Huckleberry, Finland. And I, uh, I taught for a couple of years there and then moved back down to New Orleans, took some more classes and taught in, taught high school there for about Shoot, trying to put it all together, six to eight years, and then wow. uh, moved to Dallas and taught high school in Dallas uh, for three years. And then, uh, yeah, and then I got, um, then I got married, you know. Then I met, then I met a, a girl that was uh, from here, not here, uh, Seacock, but from Rhode Island. And How'd that I, come about? I mean, just dumb luck. I don't know. I'm, uh, you know, I met her in the library, as they say. I don't know, but uh, the problem was that if you know a person from Rhode Island, and they, they're not going to leave, and uh, so this we had to go back up here. At the time, her uh, dad was sick, I believe, and we had to come up here, and uh, and it was the middle of the year, and I came up, and uh, she couldn't leave. And so consequently, neither could I, so I had to look for work, and lo and behold, I happened into the doors of Seekonk High School about mid-year, and it was January 1987. Wow. Yeah, so I've been here a while. A while. <laughs> it's like prison. Uh, not as well. It's, you, you could look at it that way. <laughs> but I've certainly seen this place change. It's changed dramatically since 1987. For the better, or do you think? Well, I, I think... A combination of things. I think facility-wise, this, this facility is absolutely outstanding. I would put this facility up against virtually any facility in the United States. The fact that you and Evan and Mr. Moran have put together this wonderful uh, program uh, speaks volumes to what it used to be. When in the 80s, in 87 and 88, it was like, they, yeah, they had a television studio, they had a co-op with whatever cable vision they had in those days, but it, it was like putting two orange juice cans together with a string and calling it technology. It was really, <laughs> really, really basic. It was like Thomas Edison 101. And uh, right up and through, through uh, the 21st century, it was like that. And, um, but there was always a lot of interest in it. So in terms of technology and the way this place looks, it's just wonderful. Back in those days, this place was done in all in the hall of drab. The lockers were itty bitty, and the lighting was so dull you felt like you were either in one or two places: the Motor Vehicle Bureau waiting online, or the track betting on a horse. It was that basic. It was that ugly. So all that not being said, there were some great folks that were teaching in those days. There were some great things going on, and there still are today. Lowest common denominator: the kids. Uh, the kids. They are the kids. What's interesting now is I have the kids now in class who I actually had the parents 
back when I first wow. got here. There are several instances of that, and that is <laughs> that is interesting. That does give one a sense of uh, time. Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. Oh yeah, and what a time it's been. What a time. Of course, it was punctuated. I I, I have to say, I did spend six years at Tri County, from 1990 to 1996 before I came back here, and that was a wonderful facility as well and a great opportunity. So yeah. Overall, I, I feel very fortunate. I mean, uh, I like the facility. The kids, you know, I mean, I get a chance to like wonderful kids like Evan. Where are you going to find a guy like Evan? Where are you going to find a guy like Justin? <laughs> I mean, you know, these are unique, talented individuals. And it doesn't seem as if a year doesn't go by where we're not able to pull out of the 11th grade stories, reminiscences, memories that last a lifetime. And that's really what it's all about, you know I, know. I know it's about the common core standards and I know it's about this and that, but more importantly, I think it's about the memories that the students will take away from them, the relationship they build, and hopefully what they learn, you know, per se. But really, what they learn are their memories. So, you know, yeah, I'm very fortunate. I do feel that way. On the subject <laughs> of memories, could you name maybe one or two of your favorite memories from Seekonk High School? Well, Let's see, from Seekonk High School. Well, yeah, sure. We had this kid back in the day. He's now teaching at the junior high school. Uh, and he had transferred from East Providence. And we didn't have this pool, we had the old pool. But still, part of the PE curriculum was swimming. You had to swim. This kid couldn't swim. He couldn't swim a stroke, okay? But he liked the water. He liked to splash around or whatever, you know. But it, he was afraid to go into the water. And uh, Mr. Mike Mooney was the phys ed teacher. So they set him up with uh, life jacket and some water wings. And he was a great big kid. And they put him in the water and they let him splash around. Now, this was like the first year that we got video cameras. And they weren't like the ones that you employ now. They were like consumer type ones, you know, the old ones you'd put a video cassette in. And I remember us shooting a, a Christmas special called uh, The Christmas Miracle with Marco Correa. And Marco, in this particular special, in the Christmas special, was telling the story how he came in a poor boy from East Providence who had reached the ripe old age of 16 and couldn't swim, sunk like a stone. And this Christmas, and he threw away the life jacket and all that, he swam for us right on the air. An absolutely incredible piece of television. I'll never forget that. I also remember one time uh, getting so upset at a baseball game when I was coaching that uh, we had this boy who was in the dugout, nicest kid you'd ever want to meet, but he was on a crutch. And uh, we were playing at this ballpark, and whenever the other team scored, all they did was ring this cowbell, and they had a cannon that they would shoot off, and it just annoyed the living heck out of me. And so I thought we'd gotten a bad call. I went out and argued with the umpire. The umpire threw me out of the game. Wow. I went back into the dugout. I threw the water, the water cooler onto the field. I threw all the bats onto the field, all the <laughs> batting helmets. And I was in such a fit that I couldn't think of anything else to throw. And the kid was over there on the crutch. I took the crutch and threw it on the field. <laughs> and the kid went oh my god right in the dugout yeah and yeah, those are two of my two sizable memories i could uh i could go on i mean my but well, i mean well go on no i mean uh you know it's difficult to pull them right off the top of my head but i mean uh it's interesting it's very very interesting you know i mean one time i remember when i was teaching back in the 70s there was this kid who i had Name, the first name was an odd name, like Breen, okay? And I thought that this kid was a girl, it was in the ninth grade. And I'm sorry, Breen. And so the kid was in my class for two months. And then finally, the mother comes in to the first parent-teacher meeting, and she sits down, and I'm trying to be very nice, you know, well, Breen's doing... The best she can. She seems to be an awfully nice girl. And she looks me dead in the eye and says, Breen is a little boy. 
And so I had actually made an era in gender. But it was back in the day when people dressed, you couldn't tell the difference and this, that, and the other thing. I'd never been so mortified in my life. Um, you know, I, I could tell you a million of them. There was a time when I tell you the story about the twins that I had in, in uh, New Orleans. They were from Hattiesburg and had just moved into town. And the little girl's name, she was in number ninth, eighth or ninth grade girl, I remember. Her name was I-M-I, I-M-A, her first name, I-M-I. Her last name was Bug, B-U-G-G, -G, and her middle name was J-U-N-E. And so if you pronounce that, it's like, I'm a June bug. And I said, this can't be right. And sure enough, and she had a sister, a twin, and her name, her first name was uh, spelled E-U-R-A, and her middle name was June. So it was Ima and Yura. Ima and Yura June bugs, the bug sisters. So, yeah, that's some pretty funny stuff. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it seems like you've lived life to the fullest. I mean, uh, you've traveled places. You've had... Well, I did greatest... things in reverse. Like most people, they wait until they retire and then they travel around the world. I got most of my traveling done when I was like a couple of years old and yourself or just right out of college. I was ambitious. I loved to coach. I wanted to go here, there, everywhere. I saw teaching in that way. And then... Uh, when I got married and had kids, then it sort of settled down. So my chances of traveling now are, are remote. I basically travel from the classroom to the car, to the house, you know, back to the car and to the classroom, you know. So yeah, I've sort of done it in reverse. I don't know what I'll do when I retire. Maybe, maybe I'm like the curious case of Benjamin Button. Maybe I'm aging in reverse. I don't know. I don't know, Justin, you tell me. Do you plan on retiring anytime soon? I pray that I will be economically independent enough to retire in the not so distant future. However, all things being equal, recessions being what they are, two kids in college being what that is, it doesn't appear as if I'm going to be able to retire uh, for a long, long time. So bad news for the student body here. <laughs> Uh, I'll be around for a while. Hopefully, Justin, I'll be retired by the time your kids come to school here, or Evans, hopefully. Okay, that's, that's, that's about as far out on a limb as I can go. Well, it was nice talking to you, All right. Mr. Crippen. My pleasure. I mean, you're you Come back anytime. I mean, come back anytime. And uh, uh, let me put a plug in for the 11th grade uh, kids or the 10th grade kids that want to get on an SAT prep class thing. I promised Mr. Petrucci I would do a plug for dinner at Vincenzo's. We need a reprise that needs to go back into production. That had enormous popularity on the internet. There were many, many hits on that. And I don't know why that has gone into the, maybe there's a contract negotiation problem that Evan hasn't been able to get together with the American Federation of Television and Radio Actors with. I don't know what the deal is, but we gotta get that back up and rolling because that was classic stuff. That was classic television. And uh, so I promise I'd do a plug for that. i do a plug for the SAT prep class. And just a great big shout out to Justin and everybody who's in class with Justin, all those 11th grade honors kids that we have that have me. It's been a sensational year to date. And we're looking forward to nothing but even greater things in the second half of this year. And who can wait until the fourth quarter when we start rocking and rolling on that research paper, Justin? <laughs> It'll be a beautiful, beautiful thing. I know. Better I know. than television. Absolutely. Better, than, Better than, television. than television. Well, thank you, Mr. Crippen. You're very welcome. My best to you and my best to Evan and the production crew. It looks like you got a pretty good thing going here, Justin. Yeah. My pleasure.